Dr. Howard Frumpkin is here now, Professor of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So of course we're talking about climate change and as it being one of the most pressing public health issues right now, why would you say that is? Climate change is one of the most pressing public health issues we face for a few reasons. Number one, it's far reaching. A lot of public health problems lead to one health outcome. Car crashes lead to injuries. Smoking leads to cardiovascular disease and cancer. Climate change is one that aggravates every health outcome we know of. Non-communicable diseases, infectious diseases, injuries, mental distress, it cuts across everything. Number two, it's severe. When was the last time we faced a public health challenge that threatened the very basis of civilization? And I'm not being, I'm not exaggerating here. A problem that deepens poverty, that makes large parts of the world uninhabitable, that aggravates every public health challenge we know, that's a severe problem. Number three, it challenges our beliefs. If we have a Zika outbreak, everybody knows it's a problem, everybody wants to tackle it. But when it comes to climate change, we're not all there psychologically or mentally. And I'm not just talking about the deniers who are protecting special interests by sowing confusion. I mean, all of us need to be thinking about changing our lifestyles, and that makes this a tough problem to tackle. How big of a challenge are the critics that you mentioned, and how do you really address them? You know, some of the critics are protecting special interests, and we really are in a battle against those special interests because they are protecting money. Uh, so we need to change that. But the truth will prevail. Well, let's talk about some of the understanding that come in, in lots of studies, and uh, in particular, the Lancet Countdown U.S. report. So the Lancet Countdown is a, a, a wonderful project. It's essentially a, a dashboard. I hate to use that automotive metaphor. We should be talking about bicycles. But it, it's a dashboard of uh, indicators about climate change, about health, the impacts of climate change on health, the investments and efforts we're making to tackle the problem, and how they're all working. We need all that information so we can track it over time. This is a, a core public health function, surveillance. Once we can follow how we're doing, tackling the problem, we can adjust efforts where needed and we can monitor our success. Okay, let's talk about that and moving forward and launching from this particular report. What can be done? What do you think at this point? Well, the report shows a few things that are important. The first is that climate change is a health problem here and now. Many people think it's remote in time or it's remote in space, but all of us everywhere are feeling the effects of climate change now. Getting that awareness out there is very important. Secondly, the Lancet Countdown shows something that hasn't been shown very much, and that is that we have, by wasting time and not jumping on the problem 20, 30 years ago, we've lost a lot of opportunity. Then we come to the solutions. And there is some good news there, uh, emphasizing to us that what we're doing can work. So cities are stepping up with heat action plans by way of adaptation. We're seeing shifts in the energy system now toward renewable energy and away from carbon-based fuels, a, a crucial transformation. We're seeing shifts in the transportation systems toward electric cars and away from internal combustion cars. So the countdown shows, as many of us know, that, we, that, that progress is possible and that we're seeing early signs of progress and that's very encouraging. Very good to hear that the cities are getting involved in trying to make a change, but growth in cities has always been lauded as something that is, is a positive. How much has that urban sprawl really contributed, though, to climate change over the years? You know, it's, we don't want to beat up too much on urban sprawl because any configuration of places where we live, either inner cities all the way to the rural areas, can either be climate friendly or not so climate friendly. Sprawl has some problems. With suburbia, we have longer travel distances, and that means burning more fuels in our vehicles. It means larger homes, which means using more energy to heat and cool them. It means using up a lot of land, and we need to conserve our land, partly so we can grow food and plant forests and things like that. There are land uses that are more climate friendly. So sprawl is a problem. But by the same token, when you design an inner city and you don't put in green space, or you have black surfaces, or you pass up opportunities for solar energy generation, that's not good urban design either. So wherever we live, from the center of a city, to the outer parts of a city, to the suburbs, to rural areas, we need to be thinking about designing the places that we live to be climate friendly and healthy. Everyone can do their part. It's just a matter of educating yourself on how to do it. Doctor, thank you so much. Thank you too.